this is the start of our anatomy and physiology portion of the course. So I'm just going to briefly cover cells in general um, and the discovery of cells, and then I'm going to skip over a lot of the stuff I normally teach when we don't have the cell bio prereq for this course. So if you need some refreshers on um, cells and cell functions, please check out our module zero. So cells are the building blocks of life we have determined in Western science. A little overview, we'll talk about just generally what is a cell, look at types of cells in the broad sense. The next lecture is going to look at types of cells uh, for plants. Then we'll look at cell content specific to plant cells, cell walls, and the cell-to-cell -cell interface. I love this image here of a chloroplast, which really highlights um, one of the major important components of plant cells for plant function. So in the late 1600s, Robert Hooke looked at cork cells under a microscope, and this is what he drew. These thin sheets, right, he made a thin section through some cork, which we'll look at what cork is in a second, um, and drew what he saw under the microscope. And this is what he would have been looking at. This is what you would see if you were to look at cork under a microscope. Um, these thin cells that are all compiled together and have no contents in them. So cork cells are dead. Um, and often when we look at cork in botany, we're looking at these prepared slides, and the cork cells are full of this waxy compound, suberin, um, and so they don't necessarily look so nice and clean cut like this. Uh, but this is very similar to what he drew over here. And he called them cells because they were reminiscent of the cells in um, honeycomb. So that's how cells got their name, and this is the first time they were really seen in great detail. And here's where cork comes from. So cork is an important component to many plants. Um, it's only produced in plants that do secondary growth, which we will learn about in a few weeks here. Um, and it's produced on the exterior of the plant as part of bark. So the outer bark is composed of cork cells and a few different other types of cells. Um, but cork is the outermost. And um, some plants, like this cork oak, make large amounts of cork. And people found a way to use that um, because it's this uh, incredibly light, low-density material that's um, easy to manipulate. So you're familiar with cork from cork boards and corks from bottles. Um, and this is where the original cork comes from, is from these cork oaks. So they peel off this exterior coating of the tree. And they can only do it about once every decade. And they have to wait for it to regenerate. So um, you can grow cork oaks and harvest them periodically. But see how these have little notations on them from when those sections were harvested. So you can't go harvest them again until a certain amount of time has passed by. I will link to this really great video showing um, cork harvest. Um, it's totally silent, or not silent, but there's no, there's no narration to it, and you just get to watch people harvest the cork. So cell theory um, is this idea that all organisms consist of one or more cells. It's going to be how we define living things, is that they're composed of cells. So why viruses don't make it is because viruses are not composed of cells. So even though they share many characteristics with things that we would consider living, um, Western science does not consider them to be alive. And from person to person, um, you'll get some pushback on that. Viruses could very well be considered living by many of the categories um, required to be alive, but this cellular one uh, really holds them back. The cell is the structural and functional unit of all life. So not only are living things composed of cells, but cells are going to be carrying out all the functions that are important to the function of that organism. And all living cells come from pre-existing cells. This last one was added later. There used to be this idea that um, life could sort of spontaneously generate out of a substance. Um, but then through a series of experiments and um, observation, we found that any cell, like an egg that would then develop and grow into an organism by dividing and multiplying, um, came from some pre-existing cell. So cells don't spontaneously generate. We don't know how the first cell came to be, but there's a lot of ideas and um, hypotheses around that. But the big translation here is that, <clears throat> excuse me, life is made of cells. 
cells are also incredibly diverse. So these are all images of different plant cells. Up here we have some cells in a leaf that have a different shape and a different function from the rest of the cells. Um, and they allow plants to survive in a drier environment. Here we have a cell that is dead and large and sharp, and it's growing, spanning this water lily leaf, um, and that is going to have its own protective function to it. Here we have some cells that have specialized to surround an opening in a plant leaf, and that is going to allow plants to exchange gases between their internal and external environment. This is one that you should see in lab this week. This is a sclerid. You can find these inside of pears. They're woody, hard cells um, that help keep organisms from wanting to eat pears until they're ripe. If you've ever tried to bite into an underripe pear, um, it's incredibly gritty, hard, and uh, you wouldn't want to eat it. And part of that reason is because of these stone cells. There's a few other things when a pear is underripe that would be different, but these stone cells help protect it from being eaten before those ovules might have developed into mature seeds. Here we have um, a very interesting trichome that um, has three different points on it. Trichomes are just hairs on plants. And then we have some different cell types overall, which we'll talk about soon. At its most basic level, a cell is a bag holding a bunch of goo and the stuff required to make more cells. So if we were to translate that into the actual terms of what we're talking about in that cell. A cell has is a plasma membrane, which is the bag holding a bunch of cytoplasm, that's the goo, and it has the DNA and ribosomes, the stuff, required to make more cells. So all cells are going to have a plasma membrane, DNA, ribosomes, and cytoplasm. But beyond that point, they can be quite diverse. We have two big main categories of cells. We have eukaryotic cells and we have prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, they have membrane-bound organelles, um, they have linear DNA, and they tend to be larger, but this point is, I kind of think I should maybe even just delete it because as you saw, prokaryotic cells like anabina, um, our cyanobacterium, can be quite large and some eukaryotic cells can be quite small. So there are, there's areas of overlap where you could have larger prokaryotic cells than eukaryotic cells. But on average, eukaryotic cells tend to be about four times larger than prokaryotic cells, which have no nucleus no membrane-bound organelles, and their DNA is a single chromosome that is a circle. So now we're going to skip over to plant cells. Normally I talk about different types of eukaryotic cells, uh, but we won't really cover those um, in any more detail in this class because now we're just on to plants. So plants. <laughs> plants have a rigid cell wall that surrounds them. As we learned, that cell wall contains cellulose, which can help us differentiate it from things like fungi that have chitin, and animal cells that don't have a cell wall at all. Just within that cell wall is the plasma membrane. That plasma membrane is our bag that encloses all of the cytoplasm. We have these big weird green organelles here that have all these flat little pancakes. Um, these represent chloroplasts um, in this diagram, which is based on this um, electron, electron micrograph of um, a cell from a corn plant. So this is a real plant cell, and this is real chloroplasts, and then this is our um, diagram of what they look like. So the chloroplasts in these cells are huge. Um, here we have some tiny mitochondria. Those are going to be our powerhouse of the cell. We'll talk about each of these components. A relatively large nucleus, and then this large vacuole that takes up quite a bit of the cell, all of the extra space, really. So here we can look at that nucleus in greater detail. So here's a nucleus of a plant cell surrounded by two membranes. There is a darker region within it called the nucleolus, which we'll look at the function of that. We have a few mitochondria here shown in different views. They're um, kind of long and pill-shaped, but if you look at them, you know, straight on and slice through, they're going to just look like a circle, but that would be a tube that we just sliced through. So these are mitochondria. You can tell by these um, highly um, invaginated overlapping membranes. They have a lot of cell membrane, which if you are familiar with cellular respiration, then you'll understand why. Surrounding our nucleus is also a bunch of folded membrane. This is our endoplasmic reticulum. And the stuff right around the membrane, or the nucleus here, is our rough endoplasmic reticulum. It would be covered with ribosomes and 
helping out with um, assembling and modifying and synthesizing proteins. We might have some smooth endoplasmic reticulum out here in the rest of the cell. But what I really want to highlight with this picture is how much folded membrane there is all throughout a cell, because membranes are where reactions take place. So um, mitochondria have tons of folded membranes, cells have tons of folded membranes, and chloroplasts have tons of membrane space. So we will look at membranes in greater detail. Here is another image of a plant cell. This is more like the one that you'll see in your lab. The one in your lab is sort of modeled off of this. They don't have um, peroxisomes in them in the one in your lab, so that's the one thing we're kind of not going to talk about. I don't talk about it very much because peroxisomes are really similar to a kind of analogous component in animal cells called lysosomes, but plant cells don't have lysosomes, so then it just kind of becomes confusing. Okay, so there's this large central vacuole. This is going to be incredibly important to what the overall structure and function of a plant cell. We have this big nucleus here, we have chloroplasts, we have mitochondria, and then we have all this folded membrane. So that folded membrane can be rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi body. Uh, these are all going to be important for um, synthesizing and packaging uh, different cell components. Okay, so we'll stop here with this overall diagram. Um, if you are working on your lab, you can use this slide to help you label the different parts. In the next video, I'm going to talk about the different parts and what they do.